also gave strength to the movement, organizing meetings, circulating petitions, hiding runaway slaves, and lecturing. Angelina and Sarah Grimke, daughters of a prominent South Carolina slaveholder, were pioneers in the anti-slavery and women's movement. Collectively, the abolitionists painted a hideous picture of slaveholders as corrupt aristocrats and flagrant sinners, beating old men, misusing slave women, drinking and dueling. The South banned the anti-slavery pamphlets and books, claiming they would induce slaves to slit their masters' throats. In the eyes of Southerners, Abolitionists were fanatics, completely misrepresenting the Southern lifestyle. Tempers easily reached the breaking point. Now what would happen if no cotton was furnished for three years? I will not stop to depict what everyone can imagine, but this is certain. England would topple headlong and carry the whole civilized world with her. No! You dare not make war on cotton! No power on earth dares to make war upon it. Cotton is king. Senator James H. Hammond, South Carolina, 1855. Southerners defended slavery. They, they had to. They were so heavily invested in it that they had to provide what they thought was a reasonable argument. They loved to point their finger at northern factory owners who had children and young women as well as men working in factories 10 or 12 hours a day in terrible conditions. Textile mills and breathing a lot of lint in the air and the fingers disappearing into machinery and so on. So the Southerners certainly argued that the North had its kind of industrial slavery um, and was living off the back of ill-fed, ill-clad workers and that they took better care of their slaves in the South than uh, workers could find in the North. Southerners didn't just defend slavery as an economic necessity. They also insisted that it created a world better than that in the North. Slavery was built on a false idea. That idea was that all blacks were meant to be slaves. God ordained them to be slaves. They came up with what they called the mud seal theory where in every civilization you must have people at the bottom who will do all the heavy labor so that those whom God has supposedly favored can be the civilized group. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor. While with others, the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. Here the two, not only different, but called by the same name, liberty. Abraham Lincoln, 1864. Well, the issue of liberty in the country always had been a point of controversy. There were people in the North who felt that uh, you could never have a fully free society dedicated to the principle of liberty as long as you had slavery and that slavery would blemish American society, would blemish democracy. In the, the South, there were those who felt there was really no contradiction, that uh, they, in fact, were doing a good thing um, by building up the country uh, and also by bringing benefit, they thought, to black people, and that it was their liberty to do as they pleased. To be interfered with would be against their liberty. So you had these conflicting views of liberty. In this fight over different meanings of rights and liberty, the Constitution was unclear. Southerners pointed out that the Constitution left the issue of slavery under the control of individual states, and that it protected the rights of private property, including human property. Slaves were valuable property indeed. In the 1850s, a prime field hand cost as much as $2,000. The South, by this point, believed really that they could not exist without slavery. And they were willing to go to war in order to preserve their right to own slaves. With tensions so high over the issue of slavery, the nation's survival depended upon abolishing it. New states were being admitted to the Union in pairs, 
one slave state, and one free. But could that balance be maintained? Missouri's petition for entrance as a slave state in 1819 would not only have broken the balance, but also permitted slavery in a northern territory. What was Congress to do? Henry Clay of Kentucky came up with a solution. Admit Maine as a free state and allow slavery in Missouri, but prohibit slavery everywhere else north of Missouri's southern border. His Missouri Compromise held the nation together, but it didn't end arguments over slavery. Victory in the Mexican-American War added vast new lands to the United States. Once again, the balance between free and slave states was threatened. In 1845, Texas joined the Union as a slave state. Congress deadlocked again in 1850, when California came up for statehood. Henry Clay and Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas hammered out another compromise. It was a complicated deal in which California entered the Union as a free state and the South got a new fugitive slave law, which gave slave owners the right to recapture slaves who had run away to the free states. Northerners were outraged to see their black neighbors kidnapped, jailed, and hauled back South without even the right to a trial. Outraged by the law, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, a book which drove home to millions the horrors and inhumanity of slavery. And it's a book that really paints slavery as inhuman. Uncle Tom, whose name has come to mean something that it wouldn't mean if people actually read the novel, was a man who was beaten to death rather than betray other slaves. And the, not the slave owner, importantly, but the slave overseer was portrayed as being completely inhuman. But it's a, a moving, romantic, sentimental novel that was written and plotted to show Mer Americans what, this, what slavery did to a, a family and to, to individuals so that the Americans would be motivated to become abolitionists and, of course, to fight against slavery. And when Abraham Lincoln met uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said to her, this is the little woman who started the Great War because, indeed, it was a, a tract or a piece at that time that made Americans take sides on the issue of slavery. Kansas and Nebraska were the next territories up for statehood. Would they be slave or free? Senator Douglas came up with the answer. If the people of Kansas want a slave-holding state, let them have it. And if they want a free state, they have a right to it. And it's not for the people of Illinois or Missouri or New York or Kentucky to complain, whatever the decision of the people of Kansas may be. In the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, Congress decided to let the people make their own decision about slavery. Local self-determination seemed to make sense. But people poured in from north and south, and by 1856, bloody Kansas had become a killing ground as free soilers and pro-slavers beat and murdered each other in the fight for control. Along with briefcases and paperwork, congressmen and senators now brought knives and pistols with them to work. They could see the hatred in each other's faces. While politicians passed complicated laws to keep the union together, real people were being hurt by them. The issue of slave versus free state came to a head in 1857 when the Supreme Court ruled against Missouri slave Dred Scott in his petition for freedom. Back in the 1830s, Scott's master had taken him to live in Illinois and the Wisconsin Territory. Dred Scott sued his master in Missouri, uh, basically saying that when his master had taken him to free territory, in Illinois and in what is now Minnesota, he had become free because according to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, slavery could not exist in free territories. His owners argued that property was property, which they could take wherever they wanted, free state or not. Well, uh, Dred Scott, of course, lost the case in 1857 when the Supreme Court decided to say that Dred Scott was not a citizen of the United States, that 
blacks had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. And they essentially said that the Congress could not regulate slavery in the United States. It then ruled that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional because it interfered with people's rights to control their own property. Did this mean that people could keep slaves anywhere in the Union? The court didn't say. With this fateful ruling, the arguments that had held the nation together went out the window. In the North, voters outraged at the threat of slavery spreading to their own states flocked to a new political party, organized in 1854, to keep slavery out of the territories. Under the motto of free soil, free labor, free men, the Republican Party cemented its hold on the North, while the South cemented its control of the Democratic Party. Illinois, 1858. The Senate race between Democratic Party leader Stephen Douglas and an obscure one-time congressman by the name of Abraham Lincoln rivets national attention as Lincoln and Douglas debate the fate of the Union. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. Lincoln is persuasive, but the voters go for Douglas, who beats Lincoln in a close election. October 16, 1859. John Brown and 21 heavily armed black and white followers seize the federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, hoping to start a slave rebellion that would spread through the South. And the purpose was simply to arm the slaves to so that they could fight for their own freedom. And that particular action showed the South that abolitionists were willing to do more than just talk in order to bring about an end to slavery. And it really frightened them. Convicted and condemned to hang for the attack, Brown remains defiant to the last. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away. November 1860, Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln wins a four-way race for President of the United States, though he isn't even on the ballot in 10 southern states. Although Lincoln is personally against slavery, his main goal is to preserve the Union. In his first inaugural address, Lincoln assures the South he will protect their rights. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. Fearing that the Republican victory will leave them outnumbered in Congress, the southern states decide to leave the Union. As each new state secedes, a bell tolls in Montgomery, Alabama, the Confederates' temporary capital city. By spring 1861, 11 states have joined the new Confederate States of America. In Charleston, South Carolina, Major Robert Anderson of the United States Army and his men have been holed up in Fort Sumter for more than four months. Their presence in the very center of the secession is an intolerable insult to Southern pride. At 4.30 a.m., April 12, 1861, Confederate artillery men opened fire on Fort Sumter. Northern troops returned the fire. 34 hours later, an exhausted Major Anderson sadly surrenders the fort. Our Southern brethren have done grievous wrong. They have rebelled and have attacked their father's house and loyal brothers. They must be punished and brought back, but this necessity breaks my heart. Lincoln promptly calls for 75,000 volunteers to put down the insurrection of the South. The Confederate Congress declares war. North and South have become two countries. The Union lies in shambles. It is time for war. 